Welcome to the Silver Level Training, Developing Trauma-Informed Practice. The Silver Level Training is comprised of two parts, Chapter 4, From Disconnection to Reconnection, Chapter 5, Creative Trauma-Informed Practice. Chapter 4, From Disconnection to Reconnection. This first chapter concentrates on the therapeutic skills needed to facilitate the shift from disconnection to reconnection. If trauma disempowers, isolates and disconnects, At the heart of a trauma-informed approach is the gift of reconnection. Whilst the trauma-informed approach, at its most basic level, draws on our humanity and our willingness to extend this humanity to others, it is also necessary to define, explain and simplify what this means in practice, and perhaps more specifically what it looks and feels like, both for us as the gift giver and for those who may receive it. Understanding this notion of reconnection, in fact, first demands that we appreciate the idea of what it means to experience connection. In her recent book, Atlas of the Heart, Brene Brown characterises connection as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. In defining what connection is, she's also careful in highlighting its distinction from other related concepts, such as belonging and fitting in. In her work, she argues that as humans, we are hardwired for connection. Our need to feel connected is instinctive and innate, and most significantly, necessary for our survival. Here I share my own appreciation of connection in the form of a photograph of my son and his best friend. At the time that it was taken, he was 22 months old, She was slightly older, at 23 months. Even before they have the language to speak to each other, the energy that exists between them is palpable. No words are being spoken, but their capacity to communicate is clear. We do not know the exact nature of what is being conveyed and its meaning, but it's evident that they do. For me, this serves as a reminder that connection and our need for and capacity to connect occurs even before we learn to talk and endures beyond any other developmental milestone that comes afterwards. Such a definition, whilst acknowledging the power of connection, equally draws our attention to the profound and devastating experience of disconnection and the criticality of offering reconnection in our work. Whilst trauma-informed practice is not concerned with rescuing, fixing, healing and problem-solving, it is about forming connections in this place of darkness so that someone might just be able to reconnect with us, their families and their communities, ultimately allowing them to rejoin the human commonality that Judith Lewis Herman refers to in her work on recovery from trauma. Whilst Brene Brown, like several other authors, has defined the concept of connection, much less is written about the process of reconnection. Although her explanation is helpful in providing a starting point by outlining its components, to offer reconnection demands that we go beyond connection to first understand the experience of disconnection and isolation, It also asks that we start from where someone is rather than where we think they are or should be or indeed where we want them to be. When someone becomes separated, we rarely find them where they were left. Instead, we often have to travel further to retrieve them and to accept that the way back may take longer than we imagined. When I first started my training to be a mental health nurse in 2001, inpatient wards still allowed patients and staff to smoke. Each ward contained two communal areas, a non-smoking lounge and a dedicated smoking lounge. As a student nurse, I was encouraged to spend time in the smoker's lounge by my mentor. It was a busy area, often full of patients who would spend their time there when they were not sleeping or being visited by relatives or doctors. At the end of every shift, my hair, clothes and skin were saturated with the smell of cigarettes and my eyes red from the smoke. I loathed it. Of course, hospitals are now non-smoking and student nurses are not expected to sit with patients in a thick fog of smoke and cigarettes. Nor will they finish their day with the scent of cigarettes embedded in every fibre of their clothes or clinging to their hair. However, they will also miss a valuable and important opportunity to spend time with someone where they are, on their terms, in their place. Whilst I did not enjoy the smoker's lounge, something significant and almost magical happened there. Patients who were otherwise disengaged spoke to the nurses. They commented on what was being broadcast on the television, asked for a lighter, shared cigarettes and began to talk about their lives. They revealed their frustrations about their medication, criticised their doctors, contested their treatment plans and complained about their relatives. In short, in this room, thick with smoke and devoid of air, relationships were built and connections were formed, which spilled out into the corridors at mealtimes and when medication was dispensed. 
What I learned as a student nurse has sustained my practice ever since. We can only start from where people are, and no matter how undesirable a place it may be, we must join them there. As a nurse, flexibility and responsiveness are the cornerstones of my work. I visit people in their homes, meet them in cafes, take them to the shops, escort them to appointments, get to know their families. I write them letters, send cards, type emails, call them, message them, whatever it takes to sustain contact with them. Reconnection both relies upon and demands this openness and commitment, to reach beyond connection to bring someone back. In both reflecting on 20 years of training, practice and education, and in writing this training, I've tried to compile a list of the qualities which comprise this process of reconnection. It's by no means complete, and as long as I continue to engage with trauma-informed work, it will grow and be refined. However, in the meantime, it offers us a place from which to start from. These qualities are kindness, compassion, empathy, withholding judgment and extending acceptance, bearing witness and holding space, story stewardship, understanding curiosity and humility, creativity, commitment and courage. In essence, these are not qualities which need to be taught. They are the skills of humanity. But when we're faced with anguish and distress, there is the propensity for disorientation and confusion. And so this following section is about us reconnecting with those attributes which lie within each of us. Using quotes from academics, storytellers, authors and teachers, as well as Mellon's artwork, I'll consider each of these qualities in turn so that they can be defined, examined and illustrated through both words and imagery. These concepts are not original, we know them already. However, we do not always know how to use them together to create our gifts of reconnection. Knowing of them is different to making a commitment to practice them. And so this section is about how these intrinsic qualities can be used to offer connection and to form that path from disconnection to reconnection. I start with kindness because I truly believe that in trauma-informed practice, and indeed in life, kindness is our superpower. When our intentions are grounded in kindness, our capacity for connection is limitless. Kindness knows no bounds and can transcend our differences in class, race, gender, ethnicity, political views and social circumstances. It is unifying, allowing us to demonstrate our warmth, openness and willingness to join someone in their darkness. Moreover, acts of kindness can be fleeting, given in a single moment which can change the course of someone's day and even their life. So often kindness is remembered for the way in which it creates a spark of hope and comfort in someone's anguish. Defined by the qualities of friendliness, generosity and thoughtfulness, it mirrors the generosity that Judith Lewis Herman calls for in her work. Of course, kindness means different things to different people. However, it is an intentional, voluntary act which is performed even when it is difficult to do so. To act with kindness is to understand and respond to the needs of another person, no matter how hard it may be. Some of you may be familiar with the book The Boy, the Mole, the Fox and the Horse, a beautifully illustrated story by Charlie McKeezy, which captures conversations about kindness and love. Nothing beats kindness, said the horse. It sits quietly beyond all things. Next is compassion, defined literally as to suffer with. Compassion requires us to acknowledge and pay attention to the pain and anguish that someone may be experiencing and to respond to and take action even if the action is simply to sit and remain present so that they're not alone. Compassion differs from other terms such as sympathy, pity, concern, condolence, sensitivity, tenderness, commiseration, even empathy in its demand for action. However, empathy is a tool of compassion, an emotional skill which enables us to understand what someone is experiencing and to reflect back that understanding. As with compassion, empathy cannot occur at a distance and is only true empathy when we make a commitment to be present and to bear witness through listening and hearing, seeing and seeking to understand, curiosity and humility. As Brene Brown writes of empathy, we need to dispel the myth that empathy is walking in someone else's shoes. Rather than walking in your shoes, I need to learn to listen to the story you tell me about what it's like in your shoes and believe you even when it doesn't match my experiences. Empathy cannot be achieved by imagining how someone feels or what it might feel like to be them. Rather, it can only be accomplished through the desire to understand someone's experience and what that means to them. Withholding judgment and extending acceptance. When I trained to be a nurse, being non-judgmental was a core skill both taught and expected. In truth, this is neither realistic nor desirable. To judge is human, to not judge, impossible. 
Instead, I prefer the idea that we withhold judgment. This allows us the freedom to create our own meaning and to make our judgments, to examine and understand their implications before setting them aside so that we can offer that space, which, if not judgment free, does not impede our capacity for kindness, compassion, empathy and connection. Acceptance in place of judgment allows us to focus on what is, rather than what is not, and perhaps most importantly to ask what's right with someone instead. Accepting how someone is and who they are is to ensure that they are seen, heard and valued, no matter what. Bearing witness to distress and holding space are at the centre of a trauma-informed approach. This involves the dedication to care with our whole hearts, even when it might break our hearts. The commitment to remain present, even when it's painful to do so the pledge to remain in the darkness until light can be found, the voice to say I'm here and you are not alone. Story stewardship. In trauma-informed practice, we do not need to know what's happened to someone. However, if someone chooses to share their experience, we must know how to steward their story. After all, there is no greater privilege than being trusted with this. Key skills in story stewardship include listening and taking the time to hear what someone is sharing with us being curious, asking questions and seeking to understand by checking, affirming and validating and believing. In trauma-informed practice, it's not our intention to verify information. The only truth is that which belongs to the person telling their story. Understanding curiosity and humility. Empathy demands understanding, which in turn requires us to be curious, ask questions, seek information and above all, to practice humility to accept we may not know, to challenge our judgments and to correct our assumptions. In trauma-informed practice, there is no wounded and no healer. We sit beside someone in their darkness as their equal, no matter how experienced we are. In this place, we are learning how to be with them and what they might need. Reconnection also needs our ability to work creatively, to encounter dead ends and reroute ourselves, to flounder and try again. We must practice beyond the limits which so often constrain our work and explore new ideas. We must find new tools, new approaches and learn from each other. We must stay open, curious and hopeful. I am most creative when I feel most helpless, when perhaps there is nothing to lose, only everything to gain. In 2012, I worked with bereaved military families who'd lost a loved one whilst they were serving in Afghanistan. The work was harrowing, punctuated by horror and grief, and I was left feeling overwhelmed and powerless. Unable to tolerate such a position, I collected military uniforms from the bereaved families of their loved one, and organised for them to be transformed into teddy bears, complete with a regimental flash, their service number, and a message embroidered onto the bear's paws chosen by their family. I hand-delivered the bears to every family. They were offered not only to create a continued bond with their loved one, bringing comfort, but as evidence that I had seen them, heard them, and that I had been witness to all that they had lost. Finding a way to reconnect is the essence of trauma-informed practice, but to achieve this we must be prepared to look beyond what we already know, to create something original and truly unique. Commitment and courage. Finally, offering the gift of reconnection requires both our commitment and our courage. Joining someone in their darkness will render us vulnerable, but from the acknowledgement of this vulnerability, courage will emerge. As Brene Brown writes, vulnerability is not weakness, it's our greatest measure of courage. There is no courage without vulnerability. Likewise, the boy in the story asks, what's the bravest thing you've ever said? Help, said the horse. Whilst trauma is contagious, so too is courage. Bearing witness to distress and vulnerability means that I also have the privilege of witnessing strength and courage. So often the courage of those I work with inspires both my own commitment and the courage to ask for help and support from those around me so that I might continue to do this work. In trauma-informed practice, there can be no formula for reconnection, only a collection of the most intrinsic qualities of what it means to be human. The path from disconnection to reconnection will look different for everyone and no two journeys will ever be the same. We are not the guide who knows the way, but the companion who joins them to work it out. This needs our kindness and warmth, compassion and empathy, our commitment and creativity, courage and humility. Above all, though, it requires our acceptance of both ourselves and who we find there. In December 2022, Charlie McKeezy released a short animated film based on his illustrated book, and on Christmas Day, I sat down with my two-year-old son, Benjamin, to watch it. At first, he was enthralled by the imagery, the colours and the characters. However, as the film drew to an end, the characters were suddenly faced with a fierce thunderstorm. 
Benjamin leapt up from his chair and burst into fright and tears. He was anxious and distressed as he watched the characters try their best to navigate the storm. He came to sit on my lap and for the remainder of the scene he alternated between turning away from the screen and checking back again. Whilst his reaction was one of fear, it was also one of concern, compassion and empathy. He was trying to bear witness and remain present even when it was frightening to do so. Later, his perseverance was rewarded when a rainbow appeared and the storm subsided, leaving the characters to bask in the bright sunshine instead. It struck me then that even at the tender age of two years old, our innate ability to offer compassion and empathy, to bear witness and remain present, is already there, waiting to be nurtured and encouraged. Whilst the mother in me wanted to turn off the film and replace it with something more gentle, to soothe and to reassure him that such danger did not exist, the nurse in me knew that this was an important moment for both of us. Because danger, hurt, pain and struggle do exist. The roar of thunder will rattle the earth and sometimes dark rain clouds will obscure the sunshine. But this darkness will pass and there will be light again and with love and care, compassion, empathy, humility, kindness and curiosity, Benjamin, like all of us, must learn how to weather these storms. Near enemies of a trauma-informed approach. Whilst there is no prescription for reconnection, it is open to confusion and obstruction. In her work, Pema Chodron writes of near enemies, behaviours and actions which masquerade as forms of connection, but in fact undermine and create disconnection instead. For example, pity and sympathy, often delivered at a safe distance, creating isolation rather than unity. According to Atlas of the Heart, pity in particular comprises of four elements which disconnect rather than reconnect. The first, the suffering person is inferior. The second, a passive and self-focused reaction that does not include providing help. The third, a desire to maintain emotional distance. And the fourth, the avoidance of sharing in the other person's suffering. Rescuing, fixing and problem solving. This is different to the action of compassion. This is doing for or to rather than with and diminishes control, power and agency in the process. Fixing also suggests that someone is damaged. No one is damaged. They are simply human. Comparison and identification. Opportunities for connection may sometimes be obscured when someone seeks to create empathy through comparison or identification. There are also other enemies which can undermine our efforts to create connection. For example, pushing gratitude or asking someone to focus on the positive aspects of their life. Whilst in trauma-informed practice we make a commitment to focus on strengths, coping and what's right with someone. This is not about asking them to be positive or to think positively. This is about acknowledging that they are worthy of love and care, that they are valued and whole, neither broken nor damaged. To push gratitude says that we've not seen or heard someone and indicates our discomfort and unwillingness to tolerate their pain and distress. Language matters. The words that we choose can both change and save lives. In chapter one, changing the word goodbye granted a reprieve for a grieving mother during her son's funeral. In chapter two, I talked about the importance of reframing and recognising wise adaptations. The language that we use matters. We can infuse it with kindness and meaning, creating an effect which lasts beyond our work. We can invite collaboration and exploration and test out new descriptors to give voice to thoughts and emotions which have been hidden and suppressed. We can name and claim our stories by paying attention and seeking feedback and by asking, do these words do justice to your experiences? Language is also connecting. By using the word we in our work, it says both that they are not alone, but perhaps more importantly that their experiences are shared by us and by others, that we all struggle, feel pain, experience anguish, that we are together in this darkness. Not knowing and saying the wrong thing. In almost every training workshop that I deliver, someone will share the fear of not knowing what to say or of saying the wrong thing. In truth, if what you have said comes from a place of kindness and compassion, it will not be wrong. Of course, there are always times when the words that we choose or the response that we find may not work for someone. It might be open to misunderstanding or misinterpreted or simply not land right for them in that moment. When we draw on our humanity, we must remember that we too are human and therefore fallible. There will be times when we are tired, depleted, overwhelmed, disoriented and distracted, not at our best our most alert or our most astute. Like the capacity for non-judgment, perfection is also impossible. The right approach will take time to cultivate, 
but kindness and compassion will catch us if we misstep and strengthen the relationship instead. I've found time and time again that the simplest solution is to check, to seek feedback, to acknowledge and to say sorry. There have been countless times over the past 20 years when I've not known what to say, of the right words that would do justice to those stories that I hear and the distress that I bear witness to. When we work with trauma, it takes us to a world beyond what we know, and for many, to a place that they would not wish to know. Sometimes there simply can be no words to say, and we must rely on our warmth and ability to remain present instead. During such times, I've found that candour, honesty and openness can create and sustain connection. The ability to concede that you do not know what to say, you cannot find the words, but that you are there, listening, trying to understand, and willing to offer what you can to help. As I bring this chapter to an end, I want to introduce a practical activity to remind us of the importance of spending time looking and listening, seeing and hearing. In a world which moves at speed around us, it can be difficult to slow down and pay attention. However, connection relies on this understanding. We cannot offer empathy unless we know how someone is experiencing their world. All too often we look, but we do not see, listen, but we do not hear. I've shared an illustration with you on your screen from Australian artist Sean Tan. I would like you to look at this illustration for 60 seconds and to select five things that you can see. Objective things, statements of fact. I'll start the timer now. That's 30 seconds gone, 30 seconds remaining. And that's the 60 seconds complete. If you're joining this session as part of a group or an event, I would encourage you to pause your recording and to exchange your findings before moving on to the next part. Now I want you to look again at the illustration and you have another 60 seconds to identify five things which you did not see the first time you looked. I'll start the timer now. Thirty seconds gone, thirty seconds remaining. That's 60 seconds complete. Finally, I want you to look one more time for another 60 seconds and to give yourself the permission to wonder about the illustration. What do you want to know? What do you think is happening? What questions do you have? I'll start the timer again now. Thirty seconds gone, thirty seconds remaining.
60 seconds complete. When initiated live, this activity always generates much discussion as participants share their observations and ideas, each wondering something completely different, creating their own stories and meanings. 60 seconds is a long time, far longer than we often spend looking at something. When we take the time to look, and particularly when we return to look again and again, we see something different. We find those things which might otherwise be obscured from view with a single glance. It also demonstrates how each of us interpret what we see differently, a reminder of the importance of checking and remaining curious, no matter what our level of knowledge or experience. Take, for example, this photograph of a young soldier in Afghanistan. It was taken by a professional photographer, Derek Ellens. In his capacity as a war artist, Ellen travelled to Afghanistan to visit British soldiers who were serving on the front line. There he created a diary room for them to record their thoughts, fears, hopes and dreams. These were later published in his book. Shortly afterwards, the soldier in the photograph was fatally shot. Ellen made contact with his parents, sharing with them this photograph and inviting them to create a caption for the book in his memory. Many of us will see an image of a young man engaged in community outreach with Afghan children, a soldier serving his country with professionalism and pride. Some may see the curiosity of children, their efforts to communicate with the British men who've arrived in their country and taken up residence in their communities. However, his parents saw only their son, reclaiming him as theirs alone, writing, to the world he was a soldier, to us he was our world. When we slow down to look and listen, taking the time to seek clarity and understanding, we're privileged to be trusted with the version of the truth which matters most, that which belongs to those we sit beside in their darkness. In closing this chapter, I'm going to play the John Lewis Christmas advert. It's December 2022, and in response to the cost of living crisis, John Lewis, like many other companies, is focused less on promoting products this year and more on the importance of what we do. Yeah, we can't wait. We got any peas? We're really excited. Merry Christmas. All the small things, true care, the truth brings. You're okay. I'll take yeah, I'm one fine. Lift. Your ride, best trip. Always, I know you'll be at my show, watching. Waiting, How did it go? Yep. Nailed it. Say it ain't so. I will not go. Turn the lights off. Carry me home. Hey, Ellie. Hi. Get a bit too. You want to come in? Wow, it's cool. You're not as good as yours, I don't think. Oh, well, I just have a few stickers, that's all. I'm going to get some stickers for you. Whether we're sitting in the smoking lounge or learning to skateboard, we must remember that our capacity to offer the gift of reconnection is something which all of us possess. Chapter 5 Creative Trauma Informed Practice. Creativity can be an effective antidote when practitioners are faced with complexity and engagement presents a challenge. They offer unique opportunities for connection and reconnection in ways which may be considered as safer and far more accessible. However, working creatively can also be therapeutic in its own right. Take, for example, engaging in art. Not only does it provide opportunities for someone to feel in control and make choices, it also offers a means of expressing emotions and the space to make sense of and understand these feelings. Indeed, it can foster a connection which is not always easily available in traditional settings as practitioner and client work together to paint, draw and create. Furthermore, engaging in art is known to release dopamine, allowing someone to feel pleasure, satisfaction and motivation. Notwithstanding the benefits that may be derived from the chance to connect with and express thoughts and feelings and to share experiences, using what is often described as a safer mode of communication. The very process is in itself beneficial. It is worth highlighting that engaging in art is not without its own challenges. 
For some people, art can evoke some strong feelings of anxiety, unworthiness, self-doubt and self-criticism. Coupled with the desire for perfectionism, these reactions may prevent someone from participating in creative practice. Making art, and indeed all creative activities accessible, is essential to maximise their benefit. For example, encouraging practices such as collage, so using pictures, magazines and textiles, mark making, using swirls, dots, dashes, smudging, using colouring books for therapeutic colouring, making your own tools such as using sticks to paint, using a non-dominant hand to work, often this in itself alleviates the pressure for perfectionism. After all, it's not your fault if it's no good. Art can be useful to facilitate engagement whilst also providing the chance to address any concerns and anxieties which may have risen to the surface. In her book, Big Magic, Elizabeth Gilbert defines the essential ingredients for creativity as courage, enchantment, permission, persistence, trust. Elements which she considers are universally accessible and are the treasure which is hidden within each of us. Whilst accepting that creativity is not always easy, she argues that it is always possible. In asking what's right with someone, we make a commitment to search for and uncover this hidden treasure so that it can be claimed and its big magic appreciated and enjoyed. Art, illustration and imagery can be used in various forms in trauma-informed practice. In addition to engaging in creating art, photographs and illustrations can be employed to initiate conversations or to represent emotions, explain feelings or express hope for the future. Asking someone to select a card from a pack of illustrated postcards and to explain their choice can offer a unique insight into how they are and where they wish to be. Equally, encouraging someone to use their phone to take their own photographs to convey their thoughts, views and emotions can create a similar effect whilst prompting further creativity. Likewise, writing, words and language can be another useful tool for exploring emotions. As with art, it offers choice and the chance to regain control. Free writing in particular gives permission to generate ideas and respond to curiosity, travelling wherever the words may take you. Other more directed writing tasks may be better suited to prompt engagement. For example, asking someone to choose five words to describe how they feel, or suggesting that they can use emojis to convey their meaning. In a recent training, a practitioner providing support to children and young people affected by sexual violence shared that at the beginning of her sessions, both she and the young person would communicate initially by them sending her emojis via a text message to let her know how they were doing. Letter writing can be another effective tool of unburdening when someone experiences anger, frustration, regret, confusion or sadness. Completed letters do not need to be sent but can be kept, shared with someone trusted and worked through or actively destroyed to symbolise moving through these difficult feelings. Writing also gives the permission to pay attention to how we feel. So often we work to suppress our emotions when they cause pain or numb suffering through distraction and keeping busy. In fact, there can be something really powerful when we allow ourselves to really connect with what's going on and to the thoughts and feelings which accompany our experiences. Rather than exacerbating pain and suffering, it helps us to understand, cope with and sometimes even work through them and emerge on the other side. In her book Untamed, Glenn Doyle writes simply, feelings are for feeling, not fixing. When I was pregnant in 2020, I was anxious about both the pregnancy, birth and life with a baby during and after a global pandemic. My husband, well-intentioned though he was, would often attempt to reassure me that there was nothing to feel anxious about. This did not do anything to alter the shape or size of my anxiety. Instead, it made me feel more alone and unheard. If I asked all of you to try really hard right now not to think of a white elephant, I can guarantee you that for the next few moments, this white elephant will be all that you can think about. It will grow bigger in your mind and take up more space, not less, and it will remain there until you pay him the attention that he demands. When we tell someone they shouldn't feel something, it will be all they do feel. A colleague suggested a writing activity which I found to be really effective to pay attention to how I feel, increase self-awareness, work through difficulties, and to explore solutions and to indulge my imagination. The idea is to consider a difficult situation which is creating anxiety and to identify the worst case scenario, the best case scenario and the most likely scenario. How I loved this activity. The best case scenario allowed me to connect with my dreams and hopes and aspirations for motherhood. The worst case scenario let me run away with my fears as they became more elaborate and dramatic. The most likely scenario prompted me to reflect, to normalise and to identify those aspects which I might just be able to prepare for and influence. 
and to begin to accept those other parts that would simply have to be left up to fate and medicine. Gratitude journals can be another beneficial tool which supports someone to connect with what's right in their lives rather than focusing on what's wrong or missing. However, gratitude should never be pushed and it can be helpful to think small and to get really specific, particularly day to day. For example, rather than saying I'm grateful for my son, I might note my gratitude for his laughter at bath time this evening. Expressing gratitude is a practice and so practice we must. It may not generate an instant change, but over time these moments of gratitude accumulate to sustain us in times of challenge, supporting us to cope. It also becomes easier and more instinctive to locate these moments of joy, to recognise and savour them as such. Both writing and art can be useful in creating lasting visual reminders of things which have been thought, said or explored, or of ideas and insights which have been gained. Here is an example from a young Syrian refugee who attended one of my workshops on trauma-informed practice. All the participants were given a blank mug and pens to decorate it however they wished. He chose to use this as a means to tell his story and has given his permission for it to be shared with you. So this is my top. So we start by freedom. So at the beginning when I was 13, like the revolution started my country. So we thought as a green, good future. So I wrote free in the green, but then the war started. So we have the blood, all the blood here. And then I have a maze, like we get lost, like many other refugees and immigrants. We have the wave of the sea, uh, but even after we arrive, we keep our identity, we are still Syrian, and at the end, we still have love. So, yeah, this is that. Not all creations will showcase positivity or focus on resilience and recovery. Sometimes what is produced in either art or written form reveals the true extent of the darkness and disconnection that is experienced. Whilst this can make for difficult viewing, it means that someone has been truly heard and seen. In this, reconnection has been achieved. Another example of this is the work which has emerged from a project, Drawn to the Moments, in which Merlin and I provided joint psychological support sessions to a group of Ukrainian women affected by the conflict. As a radical act of bearing witness, she would illustrate the content of these sessions, their thoughts, emotions and experiences, and we would use these images as points for our discussion and talk about how they might look different, what could be added to create light and colour. What did they need for something more hopeful to be created? Were they ready for them to be changed? Most significantly though, what these illustrations did was to evidence that they had been heard and seen, even when some of those images were dark, painful and soaked in the blood of their country's losses. They provided us a place from which to start. Creativity may not always produce a tangible thing to be considered or explored. Sometimes creativity may simply bring into being a lightness, imagination and freedom from convention or consciousness. Play is one such form that creates these attributes, and introducing opportunities for play can be both therapeutic and foster connection, not just to others, but to the world in which we live. Dr Stuart Brown identifies seven properties of play. Apparent purposelessness, voluntary nature, inherent attraction, freedom from time, diminished self-consciousness, improvational potential and continuational desire. Take for example this photograph of Benjamin splashing in the puddles on the beach at sunset. Such an activity yields no purpose beyond his enjoyment. He does not need to splash in these puddles. He chooses to do so by diverting from the path into the muddy water. He is lost in time, no longer conscious that he's cold or that his feet are wet or that his legs ache from a long walk. Each puddle presents a new challenge, allowing him to explore different ways of moving through the water, from left to right, forwards, backwards, and through the deepest part at the very centre. The game is without an end. So long as we walk, there will be new puddles ahead, or already trodden puddles, to be reacquainted with behind. Benjamin looks for no reward. The play itself, this freedom from rules and expectations, is reward enough. Encouraging play in both children and adults can be transformative in freeing us from the demands and limitations imposed by ourselves and those around us. This liberation once again brings to the surface the light which exists in each of us, so that it can be seen and reclaimed. In play there is only us, and so it becomes a place where who we are is enough. Inasmuch as we can encourage creativity in those we work with, as Chapter 4 highlighted, we may also need to be imaginative and innovative in our own approach to engagement in order to foster connection and to accomplish reconnection. Here I share three examples from my own practice. Although we do not need to know what's happened to someone unless they wish to share their story, 
it can be helpful to gain an understanding of the impact of these experiences. This will provide us with an insight into their window of tolerance and in turn inform our approach so that we can work at the right pace and promote a sense of safety by being mindful of the potential for overwhelm. Perhaps more importantly, this next suggested activity aims to increase self-awareness so that someone may be able to recognise and convey for themselves when they may be in danger of stepping outside of the window onto the dangerous ledge beyond. Using the analogy of a glass jar, I explain that I imagine that when we are born, each of us has an empty glass jar inside of us. Over time, as we encounter struggle, stress, adversity and face difficulty and trauma, our jars fill with a residue of these experiences. If we don't empty out these jars, they will only become fuller, narrowing our window of tolerance and creating a risk that these jars may overflow. In short, there is less space to recognise and cultivate that resilience and the knowledge that we can and are coping. Understanding how full someone perceives their glass jar to be can be extremely useful for us, them and those around them in creating a shared language. We do not need to know what's in their jars or how it ended up there, only how much is there. From here we can start conversations about what might help to empty it out or ask how tolerable this level feels to them and what might help them to cope with it. One way to facilitate this activity is to give someone a glass jar and ask them to fill it with a liquid such as water or juice to represent their perceived fullness. Variations of this could include sand or pebbles. Then it's about becoming curious, asking how full it feels and what might help to empty it out, or indeed what has helped them to empty it in the past. This allows us to build up self-awareness, understanding, but most importantly to shift the conversation to what might help so that we can connect someone to sources of support and their own strengths and capacity to cope. This activity can be initiated on an individual basis or even in a group setting and you can use different colours to represent different sources of stress, adversity and struggle. For example, past experiences, family, work or school. In doing so, this allows for curiosity about both the colour of what's in the jar as well as how full it is. I use this activity to provide education about trauma to a group of staff working in Libya, many of whom had had direct experience of the conflict and several had survived terrorist attacks. Giving them permission to fill their trauma jars with different coloured liquids generated conversations and disclosures between themselves, to me and their senior leadership team who were observing the training. As they contemplated the colours and the amounts to add to their jars, they talked both around the trauma and about the trauma they'd experienced. They talked not only of what they'd experienced, but more significantly, what it meant now for their lives. For the remainder of the training programme, it became a shared language. Trauma jars were referenced regularly, but just as frequently, so was how they were managed, maintained and emptied out. Some years later, during the pandemic, I provided them with a follow-up online session and was amazed to find, in their words, we still talk about our trauma jars now. The process of filling trauma jars can be useful as a monitoring tool to record changes over time, as well as to reflect the progress that someone may have made. Often the changes which occur can be difficult to detect and articulate. By taking photographs each session of someone's trauma jar, we might be able to observe changes in volume and colour. Such observations also allow for further conversations about what might have happened in their lives to evoke changes in appearance and fullness, again increasing insight, understanding and self-awareness. The next example focuses on responding to and managing anxiety. The indigenous people from the highlands of Guatemala created worry dolls many generations ago as a remedy for worrying. According to legend, children tell their worries to the worry doll, placing them under their pillows when they go to bed at night. By morning, the dolls have gifted them with the wisdom and knowledge to eliminate their worries. Whilst worry dolls are often used with children, they can also work well with adults as a way of validating and recognising their fears and anxieties essentially allowing them to feel that they have been heard. I delivered training to a boxing club who were building a trauma-informed boxing programme for women who'd been affected by sexual violence and abuse and received feedback from one of the coaches a few months later to say that in one of his individual sessions, he'd given the worry dolls to his client after she'd disclosed the extent of her fears and anxieties for her safety. He explained how this had been pivotal in strengthening their relationship and demonstrating that he was listening, paying attention and committed to working with her to create a way through her struggles. By attributing a worry or a fear to the dolls, this may help someone to regain a sense of control and to externalise these feelings, as well as encouraging them to share them with others. For example, when I supported a mother to prepare for the funeral of her husband following his sudden death, 
I gave a bag of these tiny worry dolls to her seven-year-old daughter to hold during the funeral service. She kept them clutched in her hand until she felt able to share them with her mother and asked her to keep them for her instead. Six of these dolls can be purchased in small brightly coloured bags from Amazon at relatively low cost or you can work with someone to create and personalise their own worry dolls. A colleague told me that she tried to use worry dolls with her daughter who'd announced that such was the extent of her worries that she would need too many worry dolls, more than she could possibly hold. So instead, they created a single worry doll with multiple strands of hair so that she could attribute a worry to each thread instead and all of her fears and anxieties could be held in that one place. It is worth noting as well that there are variations of worry dolls in the form of worry monsters who eat fears and anxieties instead as a way of eliminating them. As with all of these ideas, it's about exploration and experimenting to find an approach which is best suited to your work and those that you're working with. I use worry dolls regularly in my work with children, young people and adults in a range of contexts. For example, when children and young people experience the loss of a loved one, the world becomes an extremely unsafe place, fraught with fear, uncertainty and unpredictability. Often they find it difficult to share the extent of their anxieties with the adults around them, noting their distress and a concern that they might exacerbate this. Worry dolls offer a place for these feelings and the opportunity for us to gift an offer of connection. To tell someone that we want to know, we want to hear and that we are ready to listen, no matter how dark and frightening their thoughts and fears may be. Wherever I go in the world, the worry dolls come with me and they are always used, whether in training or by giving them to adults who are concerned about their children or to a young person directly. So much of what we do when we strive to offer reconnection is intangible. These worry dolls offer something visible to demonstrate that we are listening. They are but a tiny matchstick doll, brightly coloured and enclosed in a bag with folklore magic and a sprinkle of compassion. The final activity is one which is adapted from an idea in the Children's Bereavement Workbook by Diana Crossley and Kate Shepherd, Muddles, Puddles and Sunshine. Entitled Who is There for Me, it recognises that when children, young people and indeed adults experience a trauma or loss, they become increasingly isolated and lonely. And this activity is designed to help them to identify those people in their lives who love and care about them. They start by making a list of seven different people who care about them. They then choose a different coloured thread, yarn or wool for each person on the list, tying these together to create a friendship bracelet. Once completed, this friendship bracelet can be worn on their wrist to remind them of those people who love and care for them. And during times of loneliness, distress and overwhelm, they can touch these different coloured threads and feel connected to them, knowing that they are present in their lives. As I have gone on to introduce this activity to various organisations over the past few years, adaptations have had to be made. Some of the children, young people and adults I've encountered across a range of contexts are simply not able to identify enough or indeed anyone in their lives who they feel cares for and loves them. Instead, we use this idea to work with them to explore both who and what supports them to cope, allowing them to select anything or anyone who helps them to feel less worse, even fleetingly, marginally, briefly. Answers have included much loved pets or other animals, activities such as reading, writing, drawing, or watching a favorite TV program, walking, exercising, simply being outside, surrounded by nature, baking, knitting, embroidery, yoga, meditation, eating chocolate, or engaging in something to honour their faith. The idea behind this exercise remains the same, to explore and identify those people, places, animals, practices and activities which help someone to feel less worse. Anything or anyone who supports someone to cope can be represented by one of these strands of coloured thread and tied together so that in the darkness, Someone may touch the bracelet and remember those moments of love, connection, joy and hope and the possibility that they may be felt again. We should not forget that we start from where people are. Our only aim is to create those flickers of light, no matter how small or insignificant they may seem when we're faced with the magnitude of someone's suffering. They will accumulate and grow over time, illuminating the way out of those shadows. I'm always surprised by the success of this activity, particularly with adults, both women and men, when we reach adulthood, so often we forget the pleasure of using only our hands, of sitting away from our screens to become consumed in a task, of following instructions and the satisfaction of creating something tangible, bright and real. Prior to travelling to the Middle East to deliver the training to the Libyan staff I mentioned earlier, we developed mini kits for the wristbands to make them easier to access 
and I'd planned to give them out to the participants during the training so that they could take them home and perhaps use them with their own children or nieces or nephews. The majority of the team were men and so there was an assumption on my part that this was a resource that they would quickly dismiss and pass on to their wives and other female relatives. I was wrong. As soon as they were distributed, the kits were opened, the contents emptied out onto the desk in front of them and they'd begun to work. I lost them for the remainder of the afternoon as they sat together, drinking coffee, chatting, all the while their hands threading the strands of wool into a bracelet. I have no idea of what was said in their conversations. In this portion of the workshop, they reverted only to Arabic. But I do know what I witnessed that afternoon, both connection and reconnection. When we work with children and young people, it is particularly important to explore and develop creative ways of working which can be taught and shared with parents and caregivers. As Chapter 2 explains, recovery can only take place in the context of relationships, and those relationships which are established and sustained within families are possibly the most important relationships of all. For example, in the immediate aftermath of the Manchester Arena bombing in 2017, one of our most effective responses was to provide information to parents and caregivers about how to introduce the concept of worry dolls to children who'd been impacted by the attack. Not only did it offer a way of validating their fears and their anxieties, But perhaps most significantly, it offered to those adults in their lives something tangible to give at a time when they felt most helpless and most overwhelmed by their own fears, anxieties and sense of uncertainty. Facilitating connections is one of the central principles in trauma-informed practice. The role of the family is identified as one of the most critical sources of support, so much so that in communities affected by conflict, it is argued that what happens inside the home is more significant than that which happens outside of it. Indeed, in the immediate aftermath of the invasion of Ukraine, much of my work with parents centred on the importance of consistency, routine, communication, connection, and most importantly, love, in mitigating the effects of war on their daily lives. It is also worth remembering that connections need not only occur within families, but also within the wider community in which someone lives, their extended family, friends and colleagues. In recognising the importance of these connections, it's also necessary to think about the support needs of the whole family, or of the wider community, to ask what they might also need. Creating and sustaining connections within families and communities is essential to support coping and to facilitate recovery. At its most basic level, this is about finding ways of bringing people together, encouraging communication and fostering a sense of cohesion. This allows opportunities for collective meaning making after a crisis or trauma, and for groups to create their own shared narrative of their experiences. Anything that strengthens relationships and enhances communication within these groups can be transformative. For example, spending time watching a film, going for a walk or playing a board game. The point is not what you do, but the fact is that it's been done together. Whenever I work with groups, I always suggest starting by asking each member to explain to another what they find helpful and what else would help by identifying, I like it when, for example, someone may respond by saying, I like it when you give me a cuddle when I wake in the middle of the night and I can't get back to sleep. Or you can help me by another example being giving me space when you see that I'm upset. I'll let you know when I'm ready to talk. When working with parents and caregivers, it's a delicate balance between giving advice and offering reassurance, providing information and reminding them that they know their child best. Our role is to empower and to support them in regaining their confidence as someone who will feel certain in the darkness of their ability to hold the space that their child will need and to remain present and connected to them. However, in asking this of parents and caregivers, it's important to ensure that we give them the permission to pay attention to their own needs. Bearing witness will be painful and uncomfortable, and feelings of inadequacy and uncertainty will likely rise to the surface and need to be managed with kindness and compassion. Equally, a trauma-informed approach to practice requires that we divert the attention of parents and caregivers away from solely focusing on what's wrong with their child to consider what's right with them. All too often when a child or young person is affected by trauma, we focus on fixing them or making them better and consider their behaviours as problematic. Rather, our purpose is to help them in recognising those wise adaptations which have been cultivated in response to trauma, struggle, adversity and stress and to emphasise these characteristics in their child instead. Such interventions not only support coping and promote recovery, but offer a way back from disconnection through the endurance of love, care, and the capacity to see that hidden treasure that lies within them. Creative practice can also include the use of resources for therapeutic effects. 
In the previous chapter, I referenced my work with bereaved military families and the making of teddy bears out of their loved ones' clothes as a means of displaying my empathy and acknowledgement of their loss. Using resources can be a useful way of strengthening the therapeutic relationship, supporting someone to cope or validating their experiences through offering opportunities for meaning making and in the case of loss, memorialisation and remembering. Over the past 10 years, I have introduced a number of resources into my practice, thanks to my colleague Vicky, who's our Director of Therapeutic Services. Her ability to generate ideas which enable someone to feel truly heard, seen and understood is limitless. She searches the internet for inspiration and sources items, some bought, some homemade, to demonstrate our commitment to providing compassion and offering connection. Our most recent example of using therapeutic resources in practice is the engraving of the name of a loved one on a gold or silver Christmas star decoration for families who've been bereaved in a road traffic collision. For these families, it marks the first Christmas without their son or daughter, husband or wife, mother or father. Another example of a therapeutic resource comes from a rape crisis centre who purchased weighted blankets for children and young people to use for comfort when meeting with their advocates ahead of their court case. During the pandemic, when social distancing was mandated, connection was difficult to achieve and staff felt helpless. Offering the blanket to a child was synonymous with the physical comfort that they wished they could have given them. Of course, not all organisations will have access to financial means to purchase therapeutic resources. However, creativity does not always cost, and the real gift that is offered is the willingness to explore, imagine and innovate. Several years ago, I worked with a 10-year-old girl whose mother had died by suicide. She was keen to make a memory blanket using some of her mother's favourite clothes, and so with some searching, we found a local quilting group who were only too willing to invite her to their sessions and to help her make this blanket. A year later, I received a photograph of her finished quilt, which now covers her bed. Bearing witness and remaining present can be difficult and painful. In our moments of helplessness and uncertainty, sometimes it is us that needs to be the creators, to make something tangible using our hands. This was certainly the case for me when I worked with another young child preparing her for her father's funeral. Military funerals are often significant affairs, characterised by specific rituals and traditions, normally involving a large number of dignitaries and military personnel. For bereaved families, they can be overwhelming and risk becoming impersonal. So I made a batch of brownies for this young girl to dispense to the coffin bearers at the rehearsal the day before so that she could meet her father's colleagues and come to know their names in the hope that during the service itself she might recognise them as friends. In truth though, these brownies were baked for me because sometimes when you're faced with such anguish and despair, baking offers a temporary diversion when bearing witness so that you can continue to remain present. These trauma-informed brownies are made and shared during in-person training workshops as a reminder of my own vulnerability and courage and the need to pay attention to how this work affects our own hearts. Whether we make or select something that's been created by someone else, we offer both a gift which is enduring and a message of hope. We can convey our understanding, demonstrating that someone has been seen, heard and valued by us. This was achieved by Peterborough Rape Crisis Centre when their staff recorded affirmations in which they articulated the strength and courage they observed in those they worked with. These were later illustrated by Merlin, creating a set of annotated images to be shared with their clients, with the aspiration that they would act as visual reminders of all that was right with them. Over the next few minutes, these illustrations will appear on your screen for you to see. Although they've been drawn in response to those affected by sexual violence, many of these observations can be applied to all of those who are affected by struggle, adversity, trauma and stress to any one of us who find ourselves disconnected and alone in the darkness.
After all, this darkness does not have to remain dark or devoid of colour. It can be painted and graffitied with sprawling slogans, decorated with glitter. It can bear the words of our deepest fears or display messages of protest, defiance and resilience. It can sparkle with our ideas and insights and shimmer with our cautious dreams. Despair and pain will be mixed with faith and hope, etched onto the walls for all to see. Many of us have a fixed idea of what creativity looks and feels like. As we grow older, enter adolescence and adulthood, periods of transition often characterised by an increase in self-consciousness and a growing awareness of the expectations of those around us, parents, caregivers, teachers, peers and society more broadly. We stop creating for pleasure and joy. We become more concerned by what we produce, the feedback that we receive and whether or not we demonstrate a talent which is recognisable to others. Creativity is not about production but process. It is to embark on a journey of exploration and curiosity with an openness to whatever we might find there. In doing so, demons are quietened and joy and pleasure are able to emerge instead as we reconnect with that big magic which can be found in all of us. When we encourage creativity in those that we work with, we bestow on them not only our gift of reconnection, but the belief that to live this magical life filled with inspiration and imagination out of the shadows might just be their birthright too. As I bring the silver level to a close, I want to both invite and encourage you to use the remainder of the time for this training to personalise and decorate your own gifts of reconnection. Using these illustrated affirmations for inspiration, what enduring message do you wish to convey to those that you work with? How can you accurately capture what's right with them, using words and images to bring this to life? You can use your own creations and your own words, or allow yourself to be inspired by the writings and art of others. You can use paper and pen, your laptop or your phone. You can illustrate a postcard, craft an affirmation, take a photograph, select a song. It's your gift of reconnection to give, and my gift to offer you the time to do this. We would love to see your creations, so please feel free to share these with us via email. For those who are accessing the training as a group, if you wish, you can share these online by switching on your cameras. We recommend taking 20 minutes for this activity, but feel free to spend more time or less. If you would prefer not to participate, please use the additional time to review your notes, reflect on your learning, or to pay attention to your own self-care by taking a moment for yourself. Thank you for joining this Silver Level training. We hope that you found it helpful in developing and reconnecting you to the skills needed to integrate and apply a trauma-informed approach to your practice. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me via email. 
and we very much hope that you will join us to complete our gold level training session in the future.